Jesus in this story is calming the powers of chaos. In the stories of the Old Testament and in some of the Psalms, the chaos dragon is in the background. The chaos dragon lived in the sea. And the belief in the ancient world by many was that the storms in the sea were caused by the sudden rising or of a chaos dragon in the midst of the sea, a kind of tidal wave caused by the great dragons, the great powers of evil. And this story is also related to the story of the flood, which also reflects the ancient Near Eastern myths of Tiamat and the chaos dragon. So the storm has these mythical, legend, you know, bigger-than-life images in the stories and songs of antiquity. And it is a sign of the great power of the things that appear to be against God. So God demonstrates in this that he is the one who is in control. Now, Jesus' attitude at the beginning of this story is one of exhaustion. He's been teaching all day, so however you want to convey it, ah, let's go across to the other side or whatever. However you would do that. The uh, implication of the boats being with him is that there was a kind of boat party, you know, that they were all going across the sea together and it was a wonderful evening and so everything was hunky-dory. But this windstorm changed all of that. The possibility was very real on the Sea of Galilee that if you had a really bad storm, that it could sink your boat. So they woke him up, and they told him that uh, you know they were about to be uh, swamped, overwhelmed by the waves. Jesus' sleep implies indifference. That he doesn't care. And so that's why they ask him, you know, Teacher, don't you care if we are about to die? So their perception of his sleep doesn't matter whether he was exhausted. What matters is that he is indifferent to their situation. Now this is a frequent experience of God, that God appears to be indifferent to situations of life in which we, others, are about to be overwhelmed by the powers of chaos. That's one of the major connections with this story, is that that experience of being overwhelmed and God seeming to be asleep is here given a context. So Jesus then wakes up and rebukes the wind. Now, if you want a clue as to why this is so loud, it is a tone of rebuke. Now, a rebuke isn't necessarily as loud as I did it, but remember, Jesus is trying to address the sea. And in the midst of the sea, to get the attention of the powers of the sea, to calm down. Jesus' response then is to ask the disciples, why are you afraid? There is a significant demotion for the disciples in this. Jesus' implication is that their fear comes from that they have no faith. And so his expectation is that by now they would have faith. The contrast in the story needs to be made as graphic as possible between the volume of the storm and Jesus rebuking the wind and the sea and then the calm and then his questions to them as they sat in the boat on this suddenly calm sea. Their question is the question of uh, guys who have witnessed uh, a miracle. They were filled with awe and they were saying to one another, who is this that even the, even the wind and the sea obey him? So the demonstration of power over the powers of chaos that Jesus here demonstrates is uh, the substance of faith, confidence in his ability. It's also significant to notice that what he says to the sea is peace. Now, Peace here means, on the one hand, calm, but it also means peace. So there is a 
connection between the power of evil manifested in the storm, which is also associated with the power of evil that's manifest in wars and conflict. And so there's a connection between the storms and the storms of life or the storms of history, which are then the things that Jesus calms down. The gift of Christ is the gift of peace and of true stillness in the midst of the great storms.